When you think of Afghanistan, what do you think? Anything about Afghanistan? About its history? About its people? Do you know anything at all about Afghanistan? Since the early 1970s, Afghanistan was on par in terms of development as other modernizing Central Asian countries. The capital city, Kabul, itself was a destination location for tens of thousands of Western travelers, very popular with those who identified themselves from within the hippie counterculture. But in 1973, things would begin to change. After ruling since 1933, King Mohammad Zahir Shah was deposed. That started a period of volatility that eventually led to a Soviet invasion in 1979. Over the ensuing decade, more than a million Afghans would die as their country was systematically bombed into rubble. While the Soviets were able to destroy the physical structure of the country, the anti-Soviet Mujahideen only got stronger. And after 10 years of fighting, the Soviets completed a withdrawal in 1989. With the departure of the Soviets, the Afghan government collapsed, creating a void that would be filled by dozens of Mujahideen leaders who had built their own private armies. Each army with its own idea of what was right and what was wrong. That led to even more fighting, which continued to pound the country back into time. Then in 1996, the Taliban, led by radical Muslim fundamentalists, gained control of most of the country. The following four years became an era of relative stability in Afghanistan, but one of terror or death for most women and anyone who opposed the Taliban's strict interpretation of Islamic Sharia, or holy law. The Taliban's hatred of the West quickly aligned them with an up-and-coming terrorist organization called Al-Qaeda, the brainchild of Saudi millionaire dissident Osama bin Laden. Al-Qaeda shares similar views to those of the Taliban and therefore were welcome to use Afghanistan as the center of their training efforts. Training camps sprung up throughout the country, and Afghanistan began turning out thousands of jihadis who would one day soon be used in a prolonged war across much of the world. This camp is called Tarnak Farms. It was Osama bin Laden's third largest and reportedly his favorite training camp, earning it a second name, the base, which in Arabic means Al-Qaeda. Up until October 2001, this sprawling complex located 18 kilometers from Kandahar alone turned out thousands of recruits. In 1998, Tarnak Farms earned international headlines when then U.S. President Bill Clinton ordered cruise missile attacks in response to Al-Qaeda's growing threat. Over the next two years, as the threat from bin Laden grew clearer, Tarnak Farms was slated to be raided by U.S. Special Operations Forces in an attempt to kill or capture the renegade Saudi millionaire. At least four plans were aborted, primarily over concerns of civilian casualties and the low probability that the mission would be successful. Within two years, a group of terrorists, many of whom trained here, hijacked four airliners and used them as weapons against the United States. 
A month later, on October 7th, an American-led coalition invaded Afghanistan. One of its first targets was Tarnak Farms, the place many believe the attacks of 911 were born. By the beginning of 2004, the war in Afghanistan had long been relegated to a small spattering of stories that would occasionally make the news. The Americans had just 18,000 troops in Afghanistan, mostly securing areas in the east and the south of the country. The International Security Assistance Force, also known as ISAF, combined for an additional 9,000 troops that worked to secure the capital Kabul and relatively quiet areas in some northern parts of the country. By far though, ISAF's largest concentration of force was in the capital city of Kabul. Several countries, including the Canadians, which you see here, split the city of nearly three million people into enforcement zones, where they vigorously patrolled in support of the local police. It's from this strong central base in Kabul that ISAF expanded west in August of 2005, and again into the volatile southern and central parts of Afghanistan, beginning in the late part of the year. But in 2004, of the combined 27,000 international troops, less than one-sixth were actual combat troops, leaving large areas of the country in the north, west, and south void of any sustained covert foreign or government forces. With security left up to the discretion of ever-tense militias, hundreds of illegal checkpoints could be found all across the country extorting money and food from those who dared to pass through. For the most part, the world was focused on the growing conflict in Iraq, not just by the means of the media, but also in international foreign policy. Regardless, both at Kandahar Airfield in the south and here at the main U.S. base at Bagram Airfield just north of Kabul, things were taking on all the signs of a long-term commitment. Most everything within this theater of operation originates from Bagram Airfield, also the main Soviet base during the 1980s. All U.S. troops enter and exit Afghanistan from this airfield. But as the country stabilized and the progress could be measured, the gradually building success was going completely unnoticed. The short attention span of a world fed by 24-hour rerun news was losing track of one of the greatest experiments in democracy of all time. That would all change with the new year as the United States announced Operation Mountain Storm. Operation Mountain Storm, three words that would once again renew interest in Afghanistan and attract the world's media back to this conflict that was already being dubbed as forgotten as rumors spread Osama bin Laden was about to be captured. 
The newfound interest in the war gave the Americans an opportunity to launch a fresh PR campaign as the reconstruction phase of the war began. It was a strategy dubbed hearts and minds, and it was a phrase used before by the American military. The idea was to take advantage of the relative stability of the country and work toward the hearts of the people, ultimately winning the minds of a very war-weary and suspicious populace. We help drill wells, we help start schools, we help refurbish clinics, that sort of thing. Whatever the needs of the village, either I try to do it with, with funds we have available or I try to find somebody who can do that for them. The first objective is security. Here, members of a brand new Afghan National Army are working side by side with U.S. Special Operations Forces as the Americans begin spreading out in small groups to assess the needs of the villages within their area of operation. The Afghan army is important to this process for several reasons. The most important is to help the Americans build credibility. They're hoping to do this by putting an Afghan face on the coalition's efforts. I'm starting, but I can't build them a new building and I can't provide a teacher with the, with the money that I have. There are other people who can... The Americans are also eager to show off the new army, but a new army here is a new concept to most of these people. The idea of a unified national army representing one central government in Afghanistan is unheard of here. Without simple things like roads, telephones and wells, most can't grasp the need for a government hundreds of miles away. And it's for that reason the presence of Afghan troops is so important to the Americans. At the same time, the Americans are doing village assessments to find out what the villagers need most. Wells and schools are high on the list of most villages' needs, but so are mosques, which the Americans say they cannot build. Not everyone always agrees, but in the end, the Americans leave with an idea of what they will help each village with. That's typical when you get several elders together and they have differing opinions, but uh, mainly their, main, their largest concern is water. They don't have enough uh, drinking water. What they have is salty, uh, it's poor quality, and that's because the water table has been steadily dropping for se seven years of drought. Uh, they also are interested in having a school here in the village. but. Um, I'm not authorized to do new construction on schools. I can only do refurbishment, so I'll have to pass that project off to someone else. They also leave blankets and hand-cranked radios. I appreciate his time and his answer to his question. Two items that most of us take for granted are hot items here in rural Afghanistan. With the majority of Afghanistan's population living in these conditions, it's easy to understand why the formidable task that lies ahead will take years to accomplish. This village, assessed months ago, is now getting a follow-up call. That one. What is on this? Uh, we have one that's, that's um, to uh, support the ANA and also the ANA recruitment. We have one for uh, that, that gives Pashto and English to help them um, learn a little bit. There is. Uh, the, uh, there's a mine awareness. We also have um, support your government and a mixture of the voter registration. And then also the ones we give out to the kids are the ones that have the Afghan and the American flag and, um, and like a dove and the, the peace thing. So just And what's the coalition. purpose of handing out that type of stuff? Well, we do uh, information dissemination. We give it out to the, the, the village elders as well as giving it out to uh, select people and um, select adults so that way we get, get a better distribution so we know that it's all, it's all getting out. So, But all, a lot of it's just, just information and putting things out and, uh, and also things that we want to be concerned about such as wine, wine awareness is a big thing. The Americans want to make sure the work they contracted to local Afghans has actually gotten done. In this village, the Americans are looking for two wells, which have been put in properly. The hope is that they'll provide water for these villages for years to come.
As the progress in this village is monitored, the education about a new government and elections continues. The war for the population's hearts and minds is in full swing heading into a pre-election summer that all analysts predicted would be a bloody one. The government of Afghanistan is working on a plan to move irrigation water here. But a warm war story is an oxymoron, and it didn't take long for the press. While the presence of the Afghan National Army in the South was a sign of progress, in reality, the presence of Afghan troops elsewhere in the country was scarce at best. Even with the absence of the Afghan National Army, that did not limit the hearts and minds missions of the American-led coalition. Lieutenant Colonel Dave Paschkel of the U.S. Army's 10th Mountain Division likens his job to a juggling act. No, he's more progressive. As this battalion commander easily rolls through the streets of Ghazni, he and his troops have faced little in the sense of hostile contact since they got here at the beginning of the year. When we first got here, we were conducting what would probably be considered a traditional infantry role, cordon and searches, attacks and raids. Uh, but uh, as we transition into area ownership, uh, we're trying to provide security, so really stability operations and security to assist in the reconstruction of Afghanistan. Well, it's changed, uh, drastically changed over the two years. We're really entering phase four of the conflict, which is the reconstruction of Afghanistan. Uh, but there are those elements out there that don't want to see uh, Afghanistan move forward. So essentially what we've entered is a guerrilla phase or an insurgency. Uh, whenever the anti-coalition militia forces mass, they, uh, they get destroyed, they get killed. Uh, so what we have now is uh, they're attacking softer targets. They're acting as terrorists. They're glorified terrorists. They're attacking softer targets, NGOs and government officials. Along with the shift in strategy regarding a hearts and minds approach, strategy has also shifted in regards to how a unit covers its area of operation. This is a, a new innovative way. We've gone to area ownership where uh, young lieutenants are responsible for villages and through those relationships, as you talked about earlier, you know, through the waves, the smiles, the weekly visits or bi-weekly visits back to the same village, uh, I think we're going to win the hearts and minds of the people, show them that the coalition forces uh, are committed to mission accomplishment uh, and will be successful. So for Charlie Company, orders would take them west of town where they've taken up residence in a newly constructed home turned forward operating base that they've nicknamed Comanche. Life at Comanche is far from desirable. It's the type of living military life is infamous for. It's a place that for most of these soldiers, when they're not out on patrol, is nothing short of boring. There's no phones, no internet, just mediocre food and the rarest of showers. While there is a shortage of things to do here, there is no shortage of wind, especially in the spring when the so-called 120 days of wind can shorten the day by hours, as the fine Afghan dust prevents the sun from coming through even in the middle of the day. But the soldiers aren't here for a vacation. Their primary mission is security. With elections just months away, these soldiers have to stay on their toes even if they're getting ready to finally go home. That means, among other things, following up on information about suspected insurgents. As one group of soldiers escort a civilian well contractor, others take a look around and gather what intelligence they can. We, we take the opportunity to, to gather intelligence from these towns. We've got some, uh, basically like a laundry list of interesting people we want to talk to or find out about. So I, we usually have one guy who works with the uh, contractor and 
getting that well contract established, well, we kind of snoop around the town, finding out where people live and, and uh, just for future reference. Everyone knows who the Americans are looking for, but no one has any idea where they're at. So thanks a lot. I met the Phillips on the other day. Okay, we Phillips. just like to see Ray. House after house, no results, nor any sign of danger. The young lieutenant thinks that they're all lying to him. Yes, okay. If you would see the gentleman in the leather jacket. In the end, the Americans can only remind them that there are benefits to cooperation before eventually pulling out. But there's only one way from the village back to the base, and that has the Americans concerned they're being set up for an ambush. With tension running high and all eyes peeled for any signs of trouble, the column comes to a stop after the lead unit is concerned about a bump in the middle of the road. Because of the proven success of IEDs in Iraq, it's one of the biggest causes of anxiety here in Afghanistan. The constant fear of a hidden explosive that you would never see coming. There are some similarities, there's some crossovers. It's mostly uh, mine attacks, mine laying in roads, uh, remote controlled initiation devices, uh, or even direct attacks, but against soft targets. In the end, the bump turned out to be just that, a bump. But in Afghanistan, that's enough to cause concern. The 10th Mountain Division is the first sustained U.S. force to make a presence felt in Ghazni province. When this battalion first got here just four months before, this compound was an empty field of mud. It's now a full-fledged forward operating base in a very young form. Most notable, though, is the fact that this FOB is less than three hours' drive south of Kabul, 130 kilometers in all. It's also in the rest of southeast of the country, all of which lends credence to the often heard argument and complaint that there aren't enough boots on the ground to properly secure the country. While well, much of the country didn't need stability forces because of security provided by local warlords, the amount of space coalition troops did patrol kept firepower spread thin. Putting the troops on long dusty patrol after long dusty patrol. However, for these troops, the challenge is much different than in areas around Kabul or Kandahar, where U.S. and coalition troops are accompanied by Afghan soldiers. With not enough Afghan units yet trained, foreign troops are forced to make village assessments on their own. Foreign soldiers bringing humanitarian aid and enough firepower to wipe out a village at the same time, a concept not generally accepted internationally. The argument is that it blurs the line between aid workers and soldiers, putting those aid workers at risk. But for the Americans, it's a strategy to gain trust, hoping the Afghans, especially in these rural areas, can either provide information about militants or, at worst, stay out of the fight. The center of gravity for the insurgents is the population. So if we could do some good things for the people, uh, improve their quality of life, their standard of living, provide that security, uh, with that comes a willingness to cooperate with the coalition forces. And what we're trying to do is separate the insurgents from the population. And like usual, the Americans bring hand-cranked radios, very hot items to new starved Afghans. Some of the villagers the patrols encountered in this area still believed the Russians were in control. They've been gone for more than 15 years. The country has a long way to go. At Fab Ghazni itself, the 10th Mountain was slowly continuing progress on the main base, which will eventually be handed over to the Afghan National Army. As usual, locals are used as labor in the projects, as the bases become an integral part of the local economy they're in. The FOBs are also central command for the ongoing military and humanitarian efforts provided by the American government in that area. 
On one side of the compound, elements of an infantry battalion. On the other side houses the Provincial Reconstruction Team and its mix of U.S. military and civilian personnel. This is the first of its kind, but I think you'll start seeing more uh, of the, the relationship that we've established here. The PRT is the Provincial Reconstruction Team, whose efforts are on, focus, on improving the infrastructure uh, in conjunction with the transitional government. Uh, what I provide is that security. Without the security, it's very tough to begin a reconstruction. Uh, we've had instances throughout the country where we've built a new school and those forces that do not want progress have gone and burned down that school. So I think our efforts complement each other and uh, that you'll start seeing the coalition forces go into more of this type of model. So that people can see the work done because we're spending a lot of money and the work is not being completed. Here, business of the PRT is hammered out in all phases. Known as the Loya Jirga, it's what kept Afghanistan moving forward while the difficult work of preparing for the election continued. Many questions that I have. Actually, after 25 or 24 years, we got security here, so I'm so happy that I'm a part of this sorry tells a process that is going to happen in the next two months. For Fatima Mushtaq, the chance to be a part of this time in her country's history is very important. I feel um, very anxiously and excited because it is the first time for the women of Afghanistan after 23 years war that the women can take part for their political system of their country. The girls' school principal sees a tough road ahead but is optimistic. Do you feel any fear or anything? Are you no, having trouble? No, no, no. I haven't any trouble because when I'm uh, going out from my house, uh, I mm, put my body to uh, help my uh, people. Now, I think we're going to win the hearts and minds of the people, show them that the coalition forces are committed to mission accomplishment uh, and will be successful. I mean, you see Ring Road out here is a, is a uh, prime example of that success. A drive that used to take a local Afghani 11 plus hours can now be completed in less than four. I think it's a phenomenal accomplishment in just a short period of time. It's the first major project in Afghanistan to be started since the invasion. But its progress has been marred by small scale attacks, including kidnapping and murder. This 482 kilometer stretch of highway from Kabul to Kandahar was completed in mid 2004 and is easily the most modern road in the country. This road is imperative to the country getting back on its feet. More than 60% of the country's population lives within 50 kilometers of this road. While this is the largest project of its kind, it isn't the only large scale road project underway. Opening the country to decent travel is tops of the list for the government from an economic recovery point of view. An even more challenging feat lies ahead along this dusty, bone-jarring trip along the Ring Road beyond Kandahar. This 557-kilometer stretch runs all the way to Herat and eventually on to Iran. By election year, the road had been bombed and had eroded into a barely passable trail across the desert. It's a trip that takes Pakistani jingle trucks more than two days to complete as trade moves towards Pakistan's port cities. Erratic excursions into the desert aren't highly advised though as millions of unknown mines lie scattered just off the beaten path. And it's this stretch of road that might best symbolize what's happened to Afghanistan since the U.S.-led invasion. Three years after that invasion, the main two-lane highway in the entire country was barely 30% complete. It's a highway that in its day was a modern achievement, an achievement that now lies broken, being reclaimed by the desert sand, just like Afghanistan itself. It's a highway that when finally completed will be a definitive sign that positive change is taking root. But until then, it is a sign of a lack of commitment, a sign of proof that large sections of Afghanistan remain outside of both the government and the U.S.-led coalition's control. 
finally a long and difficult stretch is planned that would link Herat in the west with the capital of Kabul via the center of the country and its inhospitable terrain. In all, more than 4,500 kilometers of main roadway is planned for the primary highway network. The total cost will be more than 1.7 billion U.S. dollars. While creating a government and extending diplomacy was important, just as important to the success of the elections was the DDR program, also known as the Demobilize, Dematerialize and Reintegrate program. Officially, it was a task of the United Nations, but storage of serviceable heavy weapons was often at Area Fobs. Here at Fob Ghazni, artillery and rocket launchers are waiting to be moved to Kabul, eventually being put to use by the Afghan National Army. Here in Makur, a former Soviet-era airbase in southern Ghazni, American troops find an enormous weapons cache that was reluctantly given up by the governor of Ghazni, only after American troops insisted. Because the uh, provincial government in Ghazni province has uh, decided to turn over a lot of their weapons uh, as part of the, uh, or leaning uh, forward towards the disarmament, uh, demobilization and reintegration process here in Afghanistan. So the governor of Ghazni province has uh, taken the initiative to turn all these uh, weapons and munitions in today uh, ahead of schedule. So we're here now to collect up what's serviceable that we can turn over to the Afghan National Army and destroy uh, what, what is not serviceable or what they're not authorized to have. The weapons are of various types and makes, all of them deadly. I would saw at least 50 to 100,000 82 millimeter mortars, um, about 5,000 or so recordless rifle rounds ranging from 82 <laughs> millimeter to 75 millimeter. Uh, 73 millimeter. There's a variety of RPGs in there, another 5,000 or so, possibly more. Uh, 107 millimeter rockets, rocket motor sections, as well as warheads and full of rockets. There's some guided missiles in there, uh, surface to surface guided missiles, and uh, a variety of anti tank and anti personnel landmines. This is, I mean, this is where the rubber meets the road. I mean, uh, where the enemy is getting their munitions mostly come from all these old Soviet weapons caches. And uh, the, the, probably the most common uh, attack are landmines, improved, uh, improvised explosive devices, and 107mm uh, rocket launches, or, or rocket launches of various types uh, directed against U.S. forces and, and coalition forces in Afghanistan. This is probably, uh, what we see right here could be, for all I know, 10% of all the munitions that exist in Ghazni province. Take that away from the anti-coalition militia and, and you put a big dent in uh, what they could be capable of doing uh, to, to disrupt the government and prevent reconstruction efforts and election process. This is the second largest I've seen. The second largest. Uh, the other location that we were at had buildings, about eight buildings and rooms just like that. Uh, a little bit smaller but packed to capacity like those are with a variety of 107 millimeter rockets, 82 millimeter mortars, anti-tank mines and they were just not stacked kind of as neatly as these are, just kind of strewn about. Makes it a little more hazardous to uh, clear out. There's far too much ordnance here to remove and destroy it all in one day, so the Americans gather as much as they can and truck it out to a dried up riverbed where everything is stacked and prepared for detonation. This is dangerous work these soldiers know all too well. Just three months before these images were taken, eight members of this same unit were killed doing this exact same thing. The EOD experts here aren't sure if there's even enough C4 in the entire U.S. arsenal to destroy everything that needs to be disposed of, not only here, but in Iraq as well. It's a job that'll keep explosive experts busy for many years to come. Through April of 2004, more than 2,000 Marines and U.S. Navy seamen had been moving into Afghanistan as part of what commanders on the ground call a surge force, 
part of the overall plan designed to stabilize as much of the country as possible in preparation for the elections. It was a move that would see the U.S. troop commitment move over the 20,000 mark for the first time since the war began. But the mission of the 22nd Marine Expeditionary Unit was different than any other mission of the war. In late April, the unit turned up almost overnight in the remote and desolate backyard of Mula Umar himself. It was a rare, if not unprecedented, example of a fully capable Marine Expeditionary Unit effectively deploying to a landlocked engagement, considering that the MU's capabilities are based on the use of the ocean. Orzgan province in south central Afghanistan had not seen a sustained coalition presence since the war began two and a half years before. And now its capital, Taran Kaut, was the new home for the 22nd Mu as they prepared to kick off a series of combat operations that would last more than three months. But before the combat operations could begin, the troops had to establish a forward operating base. And over the following weeks, in some of the harshest conditions in Afghanistan, Bob Ripley was born. The American Army was detailed with setting up the province's provincial reconstruction team, standing in line with the current American practice of mixing combat operations with humanitarian operations. For the Marines, their goal was to seek and destroy the anti-coalition militants, denying them any sanctuary that they had counted on since the Taliban was routed from this area more than two years before. The American base also became an instant form of income for scores of local men who quickly accepted contracts for supplying the base as well as providing labor to build the base. And because of the remoteness of the area, the Marines quickly became a big source of income for the entire local economy. With the new U.S. Marine base bordering Taran Kaut, focus in the provincial capital turned towards October's presidential election. That task was not one assigned to the U.S. military, however. That task was awarded to the English firm Global Risk Strategies. Contracted by the United Nations, Global Risk Strategies is an international risk management company that provides logistics, management, and security for other groups working in very difficult environments. In this case, Global Risk is working with the Joint Electoral Management Board and the Asia Foundation to build the groundwork for the upcoming elections. We thought we were going to have big problems in the, in the southern region with registration. The whole thing has been delayed, as you know. Um, but as soon as we said to the JEMB, to Mr. Atticula, to get up here and, and, and get the registration sites open and started, he was like a, you know, he was like a um, horse out of the stalls. He, he's got it done so much quicker than we could have imagined, and, and it's, it's amazing. It just proves that really the best people to get this process going forward are the Afghans, rather than um, us constantly um, trying to mollycoddle them, which we don't need to do. They know this country, they love this country, and they're incredibly enthusiastic about the elections, which is what makes it such a joy to work. The workload is heavy. Workers need to be found and trained. Electoral headquarters and polling sites need to be identified and built. The population itself needs to be educated. But most importantly, the people here need to be registered to vote. The first and foremost thing is to get as many people registered as possible and to make sites accessible. Many of these people don't understand the concept of voting and simply follow the words of their religious leaders. But others do understand and are eager to give it a try. Even here in Taliban-saturated Taran Kaut, at the worst, the novelty of voting is attractive. And people came from miles around, by the thousands, to sign up to vote. But the process was not all so easy. This group of men are telling election officials about intimidation and beatings, how they have reports of people being intercepted on their way to town and threatened with death. He says, uh, according to the people, that they are coming from Kijran. They were stuff like that. So they told us that uh, there are some problems. Uh, maybe they are from Taliban uh, in Chorchno district. So they are blocked the way. Uh, in some places that uh, they join two ways from Chorchino and Kijran. The obvious challenges and problems are going to be that um, 
some of the local people or, or the people from the regions, outlying regions, are experiencing threats and um, problems with getting in. Those threats would soon be carried out as the worst case of election violence in Afghanistan would hit close to Tehran Kaut, where a van load of farmers was pulled over, anyone with a voter ID card was executed. 16 people in all were killed. He says uh, a lot of our people are not aware of the registration process. So they are very poor people and they are busy, a harvest of poppy and wheat like that. So when they get information about this process, they will be here and register their names. Other major problems here included money, or lack of. These men say they've been working for weeks with no pay, some of them traveling more than a dozen miles a day to get to work. He says uh, we have no money. Uh, to take us to our home for the transport like that and also no money for the food. There's no problem for the salary. Maybe we get it uh, after one week or two weeks. But at present, at the moment, we have no money. For now, the problem can only be acknowledged with promises for a soon-to-come paycheck. But there's also problems with determining how women can participate in the vote as well. Separate facilities would be needed, as would women workers, neither of which were very common or accepted here in this part of Afghanistan. It's, it's a cultural um, necessity to, to realize that we can't just bulldoze her in here and, and start telling people to adopt a completely <laughs> alien political um, you know, um, system that they know nothing about. Women have never voted here. Women have always held a, a completely different role in in life, in everyday life, than they do in our in our countries. We have to understand that, and, and people think that. I think people feel insulted. The men feel insulted that we're, you know, we're telling them how to run their lives. And obviously, it's it's essential that we can get as many women as possible to vote. But it's so important we don't rush into it, and that we explain to them that you know, it's a, it's a Rome wasn't built in a day. But the only way to help any of this get off the ground is through security. And using the strategy that the best defense is a good offense, the 22nd Mew set out to make life for the militants in this part of the country as uncomfortable and deadly as possible. During Task Force Linebacker, the combat element of the 22nd Mew was Battalion Landing Team 1-6. Made up of three marine companies, the unit's use of overwhelming weapon superiority, air power, and mobility became its signature. After a few relatively quiet weeks in the harsh Afghan environment, the unit found its first face-to-face -face contact with anti-coalition militants on May 7, 2004. Elements of the unit's light armored reconnaissance team were ambushed as they moved into position to act on information that a high-level Taliban commander was in the area. The ambush gave commanders the reason they needed to make that initial show of force, to let everyone in the area know that the United States Marines were in the area and they came prepared to fight if they had to. I'll tell you, uh, the 2 Tip Mu has, uh, is, is a Marine Air Ground Task Force, has significant capability. Uh, over the last two and a half years, there really hasn't been a U.S. presence in this part of Afghanistan. We're here to stay. We've established a presence. We're self-sustaining uh, Air Ground Task Force, and we can do uh, operations where previously, uh, due to various weapon systems and aircraft, we didn't have ranges. Now we can reach out and touch uh, the bad guys wherever we want uh, at our time and place of choosing. And that's important? Absolutely. That's how you win wars.
PLT's commanding officer, Lieutenant Colonel Assad Khan, is himself a native of the area and believes deeply about what he's doing here. I think we're doing a pretty good job so far. We've uh, been able to separate uh, approximately 250 uh, villagers here, and we've been uh, able to pull some of the bad guys, which are sitting on top of the hill, as you've all seen. Uh, we're going to continue our interrogation process with them. Those that we feel have intelligence value, we're going to take them for further, further questioning. A search of the first village turned up four dead militants that Marines believe were killed in the initial firefight. Seventeen other men were initially detained, with eventually seven being taken away. A small arsenal of weapons were also found, including anti-tank mines, rocket-propelled grenades, and RPK machine guns. Uh, there was a, a pretty intense firefight that our Marines and sailors fought in. Uh, two hours later, we were able to respond with a massive force. Right now, we've got over 500 Marines operating throughout these mountains, clearing the mountains, the caves, and the villages. Significant operation takes a tremendous amount of resources and capabilities which the MU provides. The plan was to seal off the village where the ambush occurred, as well as the village adjacent to it. In all, more than 600 U.S. Marines and Afghan Army soldiers were sent in. It was the largest quick reaction force to be launched in the Afghan conflict to date. With the first village of Taura surrounded and cleared of all males of, quote, fighting age, Afghan soldiers supported by the Americans moved toward the second village, Gumbad, where the process was to be repeated again. But once ANA soldiers made the initial assault, the Marines spread out, systematically combing the village for any signs of ACM or any evidence of collusion or weapons. Marines' orders are simple. Separate the men from the women and the children and search every house for any signs of ACM. The Marines move fast and if a door was locked, that door was kicked in. wasn't the standard operating procedure for all contact with the population, but on this occasion, the Marines were looking to make an impact and set an example. Hey, 
Most of these men here are harvesting the raw ingredient from the poppy flower that will eventually become opium, then heroin. These men are seasonal workers from Pakistan, part of the multi-billion dollar industry that provides the world with more than 90% of its heroin. It's also a way that provides for tens of thousands a way to survive in an area of the world where there's very little to survive on. To get an idea of exactly how big the poppy trade is here in Afghanistan, these pictures of countless acres of freshly harvested poppy fields are taken from the roof of Orzgan Governor John Muhammad's home. But in 2004, it isn't an issue that President Karzai or the United States is interested in tackling, at least not before the elections. Ironically, the trade-off for short-term stability in Afghanistan would be high, with the Americans and the Afghan government turning a blind eye to the problem, Afghanistan broke all previous harvest records in 2004. And as Marines continued to search on the ground and from the sky, minus a few unserviceable weapons, poppies would be the only thing that BLT-16 would find in Goombad. But that wouldn't prevent all of the men, from the Pakistani farmers to the village elders, to be escorted for a mandatory town council meeting with Lieutenant Colonel Khan. Before the meeting, Khan prayed with his men for a young Marine corporal killed in the ambush. He then sat with the village elders to set his record straight. He told the men that their destiny was ultimately up to them that a Marine could be their best friend or their worst enemy. He told them about the central government and how things were beginning to change for the better across the country as a whole. He then told them that their cooperation would lead to a better life. What we have to do is separate the good guys from the bad guys and follow up with our civil affairs projects, bring in uh, water wells in here, schools, and uh, medical facilities to show them that we're doing some improvements. On a greater scale, we have to uh, build infrastructure, roads, open up these uh, remote places in Afghanistan for uh, uh, opportunities in business. And as I believe uh, fundamentally that uh, if you provide opportunities to these people, the next generation is not going to fall on the previous generation's footsteps. And that's the key to success here. In South Central Afghanistan, the 22nd MU continued offensive operations in Orzgan province as they prepared for a long anticipated showdown with hundreds of militants in the Daishopan district near the mountainous border with Zabal province. It's the same area that in 2003 saw the same type of operations killing more than 100 militants. Light Horse 3, this is Down where we're at, uh, where Over. Bravo Company's at, they landed helos here to uh, cordon off these areas and basically they pushed through objective two. Now they're going through objective one and objective three and eventually they'll push down to objective four into the valley to check the caves. Because of the scope of this operation being so big, the Marines would once again use the help of local militia units led by Orzgan Governor John Muhammad. Militia units from neighboring Kandahar province were also invited to get involved in the operation, which was codenamed Thunderball. From several directions on the ground and from the air, Marine units moved swiftly through the valleys involved in the massive sweep operation. The objectives for the operation were assembled using both the Marine and local intelligence, some of which became suspicious because the Marines found themselves spending time checking on villages that had already recently been cleared. 
While there was some success with Marines finding small weapons caches, as a whole, the operation produced far less than expected. That allowed Marines to achieve their objectives quickly. At this village, a known Taliban village and one that's been visited before, the Marines are letting the men know that while being of strict Islamic faith is fine, being a militant is not. Dogs are a regular casualty of war. BLT-16 Marines are instructed to shoot dogs if they pose a threat. Leaders do not want a battlefield casualty due to a dog bite. The dog's owner asked the Americans for $75 in compensation, but citing evidence the village is supplying rebels, no compensation is authorized. What we're seeing is a lot of these small hamlets are sanctuaries for the Taliban, and normally you find stashes of wheat like this. If you look around here, there's no wheat fields. What the villagers do is they buy an extra amount of wheat, they'll store it, so when the Taliban comes in, they can give them supplies of wheat. And the small ammunition cachet that we found, those are transient cachets that the Taliban leave behind. So when they prepare for the next attack, they'll get their food, they'll get their weapons and their caches, and they'll move on to the attack and drop it off in the next village. What I want you to do is just stay on this side. You see that road there? It's this building and down in this direction, south of the road is where your AO is. So I want you to clear everything. I'm going to give you a search team to clear all this. Everything else I'll take care of. So do not shoot anything across that road or beyond this building. They don't clear anything beyond that. No one's arrested here in this village, but the message is clear. They don't want anyone supporting the anti-coalition militants. Farther down the valley, the column again comes to a stop this time at the compound of one of John Muhammad's friends. From here, Marines get word that local Taliban members are in a nearby house. And before long, nearly a dozen men are in custody without a shot fired. These men found in a house where Marines also found a cache of rockets buried underneath the living room floor claim to know the governor. The Marines check out the story and the governor does vouch for the men and they're released. Another group of men, three of them brothers with known ties to the insurgency, are also questioned about their recent activity. They all claim they've been following previous threats from the governor and have been abstaining from the violence. They too were soon released. According to Khan, he believed that Afghans will have to determine their own values and that no one will be able to force those values to change. He feels he has a fine balance to achieve. He believes if he arrests everyone with Taliban ties in the area, he'll only cause resentment. On the other hand, those who cannot live without violence, he believes, should be dealt with severely. Khan has an important stake in this part of the world. It's the region from where he was born and from where his family fled years before. Over the next two months, Khan's Marines would continue to execute stability operations into the heart of the country. 
They would have so much success that Theater General Lieutenant General David Barno would describe 22 Mu's deployment as the most successful deployment of Operation Enduring Freedom. But soon after this video was taken, an independent filmmaker contracted by SBS Australia released a documentary that accused 22 Mu of human rights violations. The report sparked at least two different investigations that highlighted some concerns over prisoner treatment at Fob Ripley, but none of the abuse allegations had anything to do with BLT-16 or Lt. Col. Khan. In these images, the only known images of a detainee under the control of BLT-16, you can see that the enclosure is covered, protecting the prisoner from the sun. You can also see the Geneva Convention rules for humane treatment posted on the concertina wire that surrounds him. Finally, you see that the prisoner is not restrained at all. In fact, he's beating himself with his own shoes. Even though Battalion Landing Team 16 was not the focus of the allegations in the film, and despite the fact that Khan was nominated for a Silver Star for his leadership in Afghanistan, Lieutenant Colonel Khan lost his command. He then resigned his commission from the United States Marine Corps and became a security consultant. For interim Afghan President Hamid Karzai, it was a most critical time. The presidential election, already postponed twice, is just three months away. Even so, more than $31 million in pledged international aid for the election had yet to arrive. There was a feeling the country itself could fragment at any time. With U.S. Ambassador Zalmadi Khalilzad and Afghan Foreign Minister Abdul Abdul at his side, Hamid Karzai would make his way to Istanbul for the 17th NATO summit. There, NATO would pledge to expand in Afghanistan as the American presence was scheduled to decrease in 2005. But the needs of the Afghan people were immediate, and with the election coming up in October, additional NATO troops were promised to help further stabilize the country. Most of all, though, President Karzai came to Istanbul to remind the world that while the situation in Afghanistan was getting better, there was still a long way to go. By the summer of 2004, the fledgling Afghan National Army was making progress, but things were going slower than expected. The mandate spelled out in the 2001 Bonn Agreement called for an army totaling 70,000 soldiers by 2009. Two and a half years later, the U.S.-led training effort had turned out just more than 10,000 soldiers. It was an army plagued by desertion and other problems causing fluctuations in the combat readiness of various units at various times. Those problems would largely be overcome by early 2006 as the ANA's ranks would swell to 35,000 trained soldiers in the field. But getting to that point was a long and difficult road. Low pay, lack of infrastructure, and working within a society scarred by years of war would prove to be a difficult obstacle in the creation of this army, obstacles that would have to be overcome if Operation Enduring Freedom were to be successful. The Young Army's first major test came in early 2004 when three Kandaks were sent to western Herat province in response to interfactional fighting. Their presence though was more symbolic than anything as warlord governor Ismail Khan's private militia made it clear that the National Army was not in charge in the west of Afghanistan. That meant the troops for the most part were relegated to training at their bases. One here at the Herat airport the other within two kilometers of Khan's armored forces. The relationship between the two sides was cooperative but strained as the country moved closer to its election. 
Perot province, with the third largest population in the country, was important for Karzai's survival. By June 2004, the Afghan army again branched out into new territory, this time to the eastern provinces that border Pakistan in the Jalalabad area. As soon as we came around that bend, it was pop, 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 pop. This area is filled with insurgents and the smugglers' routes that bring them here from Pakistan. Not far from here were some of the most significant clashes of the war, including the battle for Tora Bora and Operation Anaconda. But the days of prolonged pitched battles are in the past, for now. And the mission, like everywhere else in the country, is getting information out about the vote. As they go into new parts of the country where the population's a little smaller, they bring in the ANA, and the ANA is their national army. It exposes that army to let the people know there is a true government working for one, one nation um, throughout the country, and it's a national army supporting that. Uh, they're not trying to put a military face on the election, they're simply out here as um, security, for one, first and foremost. But the other part is a little bit of PR as well, to let them know that it is working and they are rebuilding their nation. The reception that we get by the civilians when they realize that there's a real army that belongs to their country and it's not a warlord army and it doesn't belong to some guy's hip pocket, that they, they really just embrace the ANA. When not on patrol, just as importantly, the Afghan National Army is learning how to operate as an army in other ways than fighting. Many of these men have fought as warriors before, but not as a cohesive military unit until now. Even the most trivial things like field sanitation and general living concepts that most armies adhere to without question are quite foreign to the Afghans. American know-how is only partially used and only partially accepted. Certain traditions, like using wood to cook, are important to the Afghans. The learning curve for both the Americans and Afghans was fairly steep. The lessons learned while putting together this army would finally come into play in the early morning hours of August 14th, as one of the most pivotal moves to secure the presidential election began to unfold. On that morning, Herat's provincial governor and military strongman, Ismail Khan, found himself under attack from rebellious officers on three different sides. The heaviest of the fighting was 83 kilometers south of Herat City, the former Soviet airbase in Shindan fighting that was working its way north toward the city of Herat itself. Standing between the city and the fighting, more than 500 Afghan National Army soldiers and their American advisors. The same men first deployed to Herat six months before, after Khan's son was killed in interfactional fighting. For six months, the Afghan army sat inside their bases, nearly powerless. How those men were suddenly in a prime position to rein in the legendary Tiger of Farad. In the center of town, the National Army's Corps headquarters sat virtually within the warlord's compound. As Khan's militia fighters got ready for battle, the Afghan National Army could only stand by and watch. If need be, they would defend the city itself, but there was no move to help the Karzai-appointed governor fight off this three-pronged attack. In the only known pictures of Khan that day, you see him here in his signature all-white clothing, talking to his commanders in the field with a cell phone. The first day, the attack stalled on two sides, but the main thrust moving up from Shindan was now within artillery distance of the city. Khan's grip on Western Afghanistan is beginning to crumble. Almost immediately after the fighting began, President Karzai, with the help of coalition troops, began to mobilize the largest military operation in Afghanistan since the invasion itself. For the 76th Indiana Infantry Regiment, it was baptism under fire. These American National Guardsmen had been in Afghanistan less than a month. Now many of their newly inherited Kandaks were on their way to battle. 
More than a dozen C-130s were called in for duty. It was their job to ferry nearly 1,500 Afghan soldiers and roughly 80 American advisors to Herat province in an effort to contain the fighting. It would be the largest and boldest military move made by the interim Karzai government. Coming just two months before the election itself, it was a huge test for the new Afghan National Army. The world press, which barely covered the Afghan National Army, had been describing Karzai's authority as relevant only to areas around the capital of Kabul. Now was the time Hamid Karzai would show his teeth. The plan called for the troops to land on the tarmac of the crumbling old Soviet airbase at Shindan, south of the fighting. It's at this airbase where the primary prong of the rebellion began. Afghan and American troops already in position in Herat would seal the northern end of the fighting, theoretically containing the action, which included dozens of tanks. Everyone involved expected to be landing under fire. By the time the first Afghan troops arrived, U.S. Special Forces had already secured the base, as the fighting continued just to the north, slowly moving toward Harai. Soon after the arrival of coalition troops, heavy fighting stopped and a ceasefire was arranged, but not before the political landscape in western Afghanistan had dramatically changed. The initial quick reaction force was quickly reinforced by nearly a thousand Afghan national police, a second tier security force primarily being trained by the German government. Once the fighting stopped, the lead renegade commander, Amanullah Khan, was spirited out of the city to Kabul, put under a loose form of house arrest, even while his men held dozens of Khan's foot soldiers prisoner. In the end, Ismail Khan was offered a job in Karzai's government, but he refused, deciding instead to become a private citizen for the time being. This is advanced infantry training, Afghan style. At this stage in the life of this army, small unit tactics are about all the Afghans have managed to grasp. In such an inhospitable area, the enemy is rarely seen. And then there were two guys on the hilltop back here when we stopped our first time. So one of the men started walking off, running down the ridge this way. So when we stopped the second time, the second guy that we saw moving was out of sight. The first guy was still there, so we came up this side to see what they were up to. Did find him? Well, the, the shepherd boy said he was one of them. He said there wasn't another man up there. Okay. But we, the commandant and I both saw two men up there. The job of teaching those tactics fall to American ETTs, otherwise known as embedded training teams. This Kandak, based in Kalat, provides most of the security for the city and the surrounding areas in Zabal province. Based in a 19th century British fort, their living quarters are surrounded by tons of old munitions from wars gone by. Their job, to patrol the areas surrounding the provincial capital, keeping an eye out for any sign of trouble that could disrupt the election. From this base, U.S. ETTs attached to the 45th Infantry Division helped these new soldiers hone their skills. A dozen advisors in all helped guide more than 500 Afghans in the art of small unit warfare. Wait, 
These men, part of the third rotation of U.S. advisors, are close to going home. But being short on time doesn't mean it's time to slack off. Even here in a very troubled Zabal province, the Green Berets of the ANA get signs of approval as they patrol the countryside. With the election just a few months away, the troops keep the pressure up. These soldiers, considered veterans of the ANA, didn't start out so organized. It's taken them more than a year of non-stop training in real combat conditions to get to this point. Experience would prove to be a decisive factor for the ANA in September of 2004, a little more than a month after strongman Ismail Khan was removed from power. Riots erupted in Herat as hundreds set fire to shops, aid agencies, and UN buildings. Alongside American ETTs, the ANA was able to control and limit the riots, which subsided after a few tense days. Taking no chances, the Americans sent reinforcements to Herat and effectively helped the Afghans stabilize the vital city. Life as an embedded trainer is much different than life for most other soldiers serving in Afghanistan. Embedded trainers, it's, you're not a complete unit, so you're supporting yourself. Uh, and it's, it's trying to understand how to get items in town, soap, fuel, food, is a lot more difficult than it is just going to Walmart. Or being in the Army. Yes, or being in the Army where there's a unit that you, you know where they're located and you can go and get those items of supply. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Since Task Force Phoenix formed, the U.S. Army's National Guard has been tasked with training the new Afghan National Army. It's the training I've learned is kind of a train the trainer. Now I'm trying to work with these officers in the Afghan National Army that they can solve their own problems, that they don't have to rely upon us to uh, develop their mission plans. Uh, and I think they're doing a really good job of that. They, they can look at a mission they're given and design a plan that will help them succeed in the mission. I think the thing that we need to come further in than we are uh, is the logistics side of it for the Afghan National Army. And I think we're starting to get that turn going but it's going to be a while. Working in groups of 12 to 15, the ETTs lived in separate quarters than the men they trained, but were nearby 24 hours a day. As a new recruit to the Afghan National Army, your hitch would start here at the Kabul Military Training Center, also known as KMTC, the Afghan version of boot camp. For the past 30 years, Afghan warlords have helped keep the winds of war blowing in one direction or the other. One of the most difficult tasks for the coalition is the disarming of those militias. The coalition hopes the key is to provide the men with job skills or a spot in the new Afghan National Army. The government tried many incentives to whittle away at the militias. Some worked, some didn't. These men are the last to get an opportunity to retain their officer rank as they move from militia life to army life. They'll go through their own boot camp together, but once trained, they'll eventually be split up and assigned to various Kandaks around the country. Regular army recruits are taken from all corners of Afghanistan. By the summer of 2004, recruiting stations had been set up in at least 15 of Afghanistan's 34 provinces. Salam, 
Some of them seem to be enjoying it a lot because they're doing it for their country and they understand why they're doing it for their country. So after we leave, they'll be able to sustain the training and carry on without any supervision. And uh, it seems to be going real well. They're in their eighth week and they're getting a little bit more training, more hands-on than what a regular U.S. Army basic training would get. Uh, they're going straight from basic straight to a mortar, so it'd be straight to a, a, a job description, which we'd go through the whole eight weeks of basic and then go to a job. Uh, they're getting it crunched down real short, so uh, they're getting they're getting right into it real fast. Some of the soldiers are just going through the motions. When they put that rod through the barrel, they should see that rod come out the chamber. One, one of the problems, the reason that was happening was because the rod was too short, so maybe there's some way we can get along. The biggest thing is uh, the language barrier and then going through the, the translator and getting uh, our point across and then them being able to translate it exactly the way we want it. To me, it's, it's we're more standoffish, and the ANA is actually running the show, and we're trying to ease our uh, our presence into the rear. So whenever they do have a question, we can help lead them in the right direction, so they'll be able to answer it for themselves. This army is the exit strategy for the Americans. Once it's up and running and able to defend the elected government, the Americans hope to pull the bulk of their troops out as NATO takes over the lead role in 2006. By September 2004, around 12,000 ANA troops were trained and in the field, most of them involved in combat operations. This Kandak, like all graduating Kandaks, performed the Atan Dance, a traditional Afghan dance that is now a tradition for graduating recruits as well. This Kandak is also the last Kandak to graduate before the presidential election. And unlike any other Kandak, they'll be put to a test that will have them making a difficult choice between family and country. Part of the challenge the coalition had with the Afghan National Army at this time involved money. There was a lack of infrastructure to get the men paid, and when they did get paid, many times unit strength would dwindle overnight as scores of men went absent without leave. Depending on where the soldier was paid would depend on how long it took him to get to his family, settle business, and then return. Some never do return, taking the paycheck and the satisfaction, knowing that $70 a month isn't enough for a life in the new army. With the election just a month away, the Afghan Ministry of Interior was concerned about paying 25 Kandak, the final Kandak, to graduate before the election. The fear was that the men would follow current practice and leave just before a very critical time in the country's history. The Afghan officers in charge were quietly nervous of the men's reaction when told their pay would be held until after the elections. Not only that, but they were shipping out immediately to the spiritual heart of the Taliban. 25 Kandak was going to Kandahar. 25 Kandak would have another striking distinction. They would be the first Afghan unit led by non-American embedded training teams. This Romanian embedded training team is the first from that country and one of the few non-American conventional units to deploy downrange. By the summer of 2004, ISAF had bolstered its force to nearly 9,000 men, the largest contingent being offered by Canada, with more than 1,900 soldiers in Afghanistan. Here, Canadian forces based out of Camp Julian patrol their sector of the capital Kabul, which is split into sectors of responsibility. Most of the ISAF troops are stationed in or near the capital, providing stability for the capital and the fledgling government. In 2004, just one serious car bomb shook the capital. 
the most part, the city was a bustling center of activity and its three million inhabitants worked to eke out a life in one of the poorest countries in the world. For the first time in two decades, the people here were enjoying consecutive years of peace and it showed all over the capital. But things in the west and south were not as peaceful. While the French maintained 200 commandos near the border town of Spinboldak, the Romanians provided forced security for the growing base at Kandahar Airfield. It's a place in the global war on terror Romania wants to be. Their relationship with the Americans here has been good. Big points for Romania as they try to join NATO and entice the United States to build bases in their country, which were approved by the Romanian government in 2005. The unit rotates every six months and was first deployed to Kandahar in 2002. By 2004, the Romanians' mission had grown and they were now set to deploy to the city of Kandahar itself to help guide a Kandak of nearly 800 Afghan soldiers. New recruits the Romanians have been training now for several weeks. But first there's a fear that the men will mutiny when their commanding officer tells them they won't be paid and that they're being deployed to Kandahar. While the decision not to pay the men was made by the Afghans, the Americans were expected to break the news, something the Americans don't want to do. While the two sides decide what to do, armed soldiers begin to drift into the formation to help keep the peace in the event things go wrong. In the end, with the Americans by their side, the Afghans take responsibility for the situation. Amidst grumbles, the men would calmly return to their barracks and ponder their next move. Surprisingly, by morning, only a handful from 25 Kandak deserted, and within two days, the rest would be on their way to Kandahar. Their task will take them as a national Afghan army in force to the heart of the Taliban. The strategy, the government's display of strength, will reassure people into voting. The total number of Americans killed in Afghanistan was just cresting 100 in the summer of 2004. Afghan troops on the front lines were taking much heavier casualties. Afghan militia forces known as AMF are also part of the complicated security situation in pre-election Afghanistan. These fighters are aligned to one of more than a dozen warlords that help fill the security void the coalition and Afghan government can't cover. Here in the eastern province of Kaust, dozens struggle for survival in very difficult conditions. American Marines have been spending tens of thousands of dollars here to upgrade the hospital. It's one of dozens of ongoing humanitarian missions in this frontline province, not long ago a bastion of the Taliban. In Coast right now we've got uh, well over a dozen projects going. One of them is the hospital that you see here is the military hospital. The, uh, the hospital doesn't only take military people, it takes civilians also. What we do is uh, we augment the PRT's work. They're building a new uh, wing here for them. We don't have that kind of money. What we give them are medicines, we give them supplies, things like that. And we do it monthly and it's really what keeps this place going. What is his medicine doing? General Kilbaz is in charge of most of the security in this region. According to the Marines, he's known as the Butcher of Kaust for his brutal tactics employed against the Taliban and the Russians before that. His efforts are now directed toward pre-election stability. The security in Kaos is uh, it's completely safe, for the, especially for the voting system and voting aside, voting in election. And the coalition forces together with Afghani forces, KPF, AMF, 
we are working together to bring peace and stability to the Kaos province. And till now, more than 200,000 people registered their name for the election. Kaos is also home to the larger than normal forward operating base called Salerno. Less than 20 kilometers from Pakistan, it's a base that's often under enemy rocket fire. It's also a major launching point for troops leading the fight along the Pakistani border. Smith, yeah. Stanley, yeah. England, yeah. McCarthy, yeah. Gaddis, yeah. Dernan, yeah. Smith, yeah. Sickles, yeah. round three. Fighting that was surprisingly light at this time, even in the militant infested areas surrounding Salerno. Over a mountain range adjacent to Salerno, choppers check out their hardware before heading out on a scouting mission. unforgiving terrain that makes a small, elusive enemy very difficult to find. Missions like this one are used to get a bird's eye view of the lay of the land for future ground missions. Most patrols last three days to a week, and most of them start by helicopter and end by helicopter. While combat is light in this area, the Americans say a security presence is mandatory to stemming the tide of insurgents and weapons crossing the border from Pakistan's lawless Waziristan region. Like everywhere else in the country, the talk is about security for the election. So you haven't had any problems with them, though? No, no, not sure. John Morse of yeah. Global Risk well, Strategies has the job of overseeing Kaos election process for the United Nations. Kaos uh, is a quite an interesting district in Afghanistan. It's, it's very conservative, uh, it's strong Pashtun, uh, and has strong Shore and tribal leaders. Um, it's historically been, been known as a, as a problem area, and it was a headquarters for the Taliban during the Taliban regime. Um, since we've been here, uh, we've managed to get the people of Haas on, on our side, on the registration process side. Uh, the religious leaders and tribal elders have been um, pro-registration, uh, pro-election, and they've helped us a lot. So it's been a great success. We were, um, uh, the civilian census said that there was something like 156,000 people in Haas, and that was our target for registration. We've registered 270,000 people. And also, uh, the target was to, to register uh, 9 or 10 out of the 14 districts, and we've registered every district. We give so them Russian jeeps. Oh, okay. They got so six Russian jeeps. Do they actually come to Over the time he's here? been here, he's seen a change um, and is optimistic no, the election six. process no, will be a reality in an area few believed was possible just a year ago. Well, I said that it's been a success because you know, the Afghan people have embraced the process, but obviously, you know, the actual, um, the feel. Uh, of the district uh, is is secure. You know, the area, people are happier to walk around because they know that the area is a lot safer, and that's and that's because of the coalition forces. I mean, the work they've been doing on the border and the work they've been doing, you know, provincial reconstruction is excellent, and it's it's helped to rebuild the whole the whole district. Uh, action upon contact. In case of an I, in case of uh, an IED. Uh, in case of IED, we'll With commands stop. in both Afghanistan uh, and Iraq, the 25th Infantry Division, known as Tropic Lightning, was a very busy unit in 2004. And then we'll take the, uh, Here at Kandahar Airfield, members of Task Force Bronco are getting ready for a supply run into the city of Kandahar itself as preparations for the election continues. So keep your heads in the game. You got a lot of cargo going in. All right, and it's in closed space going in the southern half of the city. So gunners be aware, TCs be aware, you got the big trucks, be careful if you have to weave in through traffic. All right? Uh, 
be aware there's a lot of local security, Afghan security out there. Some uniformed in the black uniforms or BD uniforms and some not. The emergence of IEDs as the primary weapon in Iraq, troops in Afghanistan were also constantly educated about the danger they could pose here as well. While IEDs did occur throughout the country, the frequency was very low. Even though attacks in Kandahar were infrequent, it's still a very dangerous city, particularly for foreigners. It's full of Taliban sympathizers, spies, and militants. It's a city that suffered incredible brutality under the Soviets. It was the epicenter of the Taliban after that. Peace is not something this area has seen in many years. If there was one city in Afghanistan with a high probability of a major attack, as promised by the militants, it would be here. While ISAF, for the most part, worked independently of the Americans, the Romanians in Kandahar, part of Task Force Bronco, worked directly under U.S. command. Inside the coalition's Kandahar headquarters, American, Afghan, and Romanian officers attached to 25 Kandak work out the plan for election security. The security issue is a sensitive one, but essentially is broken into three rings. The inner ring, which is made up of Afghan security, would protect polling centers and other election-oriented facilities. The Romanians, working with 25 Kandak, would be the primary security in the city's center. The Americans assign themselves the outer ring of security, which includes highly mobile patrols and quick reaction forces. The Americans want to stay as far away from the ballots and polling centers as possible in an effort to avoid accusations of tampering or influence. And as a stark reminder of the danger of IEDs, once again, reminders are handed out. This IED recently killed a district police chief. To the Americans, 25 Kandak is what they hoped all Kandaks would be like. To them, the fact that the units stayed together and deployed without pay to a very dangerous area instilled confidence in the program set up to create this new army. Using size and discipline as a sign of strength, the Americans hoped the people of Kandahar would see a proud, professional, and unified Afghan National Army. The hope was to instill confidence in the people that the central government was gaining control of the country. These patrols were unique in Afghanistan. Afghan officers and NCOs lead the patrols, the Romanians offer expertise, and an American PSYOPs team spreads UN-produced literature regarding the election and the idea of a central government. For many Afghans, it was a notion that was so foreign to them, an Afghan national army, elections, relative peace and stability. For the Americans, this strategy of putting an Afghan face on most everything they did was well pronounced throughout the country in 2004. The Americans felt that ensuring the population saw change in progress was essential. The more the people saw Afghans in charge, the more likely trust could be built, which in turn is progress in the fight against the militants. That progress would become clearly evident just two days before the elections. That's when Afghan intelligence received word that a large vehicle-borne improvised explosive device known as a V-bed was en route to Kandahar. The information claimed a gasoline tanker full of fuel was leaving Pakistan, the intended target being the ballot counting center at Kandahar Stadium. Afghan troops stopped a vehicle matching the description two kilometers outside the city's eastern gate. There, an American bomb sniffing dog found the tanker's wheels lined with explosives. All three Pakistani men in the tanker were arrested and the tanker harmlessly destroyed. But the incident underscored the tenuous security situation leading up to the election and everyone was on edge. And it would be here that the UN would set up a regional ballot collection site. 
For weeks before the election, workers turned a stadium once used for executions by the Taliban into an area that would count some of the country's first ever presidential ballots. On election day, security around Afghanistan was unprecedented in regards to operation during freedom. In Kandahar, most roads were closed and vehicles restricted from operation, which provided a surreal feeling to election day morning as thousands made their way on foot to cast their vote. The atmosphere was one of apprehension and excitement. Security at the polls was tight enough that even Western journalists with proper accreditation had trouble getting in. These men were ordered to allow no one in without a voter ID card. Inside, however, order seemed to rule the day, with the process flowing well, even here at the day's peak time. The purple dye used to mark the fingers of those that voted would turn out to be the biggest problem of the day. The die was not as permanent as expected, and some accusations of multiple voting were soon leveled. But concerns that voters would be singled out by militants for having the mark, for the most part, didn't materialize anywhere in the country. Other difficulties with the election included the lack of facilities for women. In Kandahar, there were just two polling centers for women, compared to more than a dozen for the men. Because of the conservative nature of this region, the drive to get women to the polls was at first resisted, but then energized by pleas from Karzai himself, who relied heavily on the majority Pashtun vote this area could potentially provide. Here in the South, estimates that just 19% of the voters were women is offset by the UN's estimate that overall across the entire country of Afghanistan, 41% of the 10 million voters were women as well. Some independent observers question those numbers. One thing that can't be refuted is that women did get to vote, something that took the United States 31 presidential elections to achieve. While the election was over without any major attacks anywhere in Afghanistan, the process of counting the vote still remained. With many polling centers in remote areas, it would be days before counting would begin. Some polling sites were only accessible by mule. The platinum. This would give the United Nations breathing room to continue to hire and train workers wanting to support the process. The stadium was one of eight vote counting centers in the country and by election day was still not ready for the hundreds of thousands of votes heading this way from all around the south of the country. Four days after the elections, the votes finally started coming in and the process of counting them got underway. Almost three years to the day since the Americans' first Tomahawk missiles slammed into Afghanistan, its people were busy getting ready to count the votes for the country's first ever presidential election results. The irony at this time is absolutely incredible. In a stadium that just a few years before was the site of death and tyranny, an experiment in democracy was now underway. With the Afghan presidential election over, U.S. troops, along with much of the world, turned their attention to the U.S. presidential election. In 
the world's eye, 2004 was a difficult year for the United States and its post-911 foreign policy. Cultural differences between the predominantly Christian society in America and the Muslim people of both Afghanistan and Iraq would cause further friction in the world press. Allegations and then evidence of widespread prisoner abuse in both countries also came to light, diminishing anything good the U.S.-led coalition was accomplishing. And in the end, it all overshadowed the successful security plan that allowed elections in Afghanistan to take place. In the weeks after the election, the American offensive strategy employed all year didn't slow down, even though the area of land it controlled shifted with the summer's erratic change of events. While the coalition gained ground in regards to trust, the process was very difficult. On this patrol, members of the 29th Infantry Division are looking for those responsible for firing on another patrol across the valley. No one in this village has seen or heard a thing. But as the soldiers were getting ready to leave, a villager stepped up and said he had information on Al-Qaeda members hiding nearby. Because the man feared for his life, he asked that the soldiers make it look like they were arresting him. Yet another example of the fine balance the foreign troops face here in Afghanistan. To understand just how fluid the military situation is here, and how few troops are operating in Afghanistan, a return visit to Fab Ghazni six months later may provide some idea. The Fab, started less than a year before, was finally beginning to look like a permanent base. That wasn't the only change. Strength-wise, instead of a full reinforced battalion of regular army troops here, Virginia National Guard troops with less than half the strength now occupy the FOB. Instead of having several outlying fire bases, the soldiers now operate from the main FOB itself, conducting patrols that could last for more than a week, making presence patrols throughout the province far less frequent than just a few months before. Commanders say the lack of resources they get are justifiable as they're needed in more dangerous areas of the country. The world intervention into Afghanistan should be far from over. There's just so much to do here. After having spent more than seven months in Afghanistan, perhaps no one other experience exemplifies my feeling about its future than this one, and it just happened to be my very last embed. While the Americans worked to put together and distribute gifts of aid in celebration of the Muslim holy time of Eid, a scene unfolded that's indicative of how fragile the country seems to be. Men and women, most in burqas, patiently wait for the soldiers to give out the aid. Consistent with Afghan culture, the men and women stay separated. Inconsistent with Afghan culture, but meant as a gesture of respect, women are given the front of the line, as they would in most Western countries. While things started well, within 10 minutes, young men and boys started to pilfer goods from the sides of the tent. The situation quickly deteriorated as the outnumbered soldiers can only try to fend off the onslaught. The attempts are futile as desperation and self-preservation overtake the crowd. What just minutes ago was peace and harmony during a religious time of atonement has quickly turned into a battle of the fittest. This country is shattered to its very core, both physically and mentally.
Afghanistan is a country in need of a chance, a chance that will require a lot of patience. If there's one thing the Afghans seem to fear the most, it's not the Taliban, it's not the Americans, and it's not the drugs. What the Afghans seem to fear the most is that the world will leave them before the work is done, before the country can stand on its own two feet again. It's a situation that most everyone here agrees. We once again steer these people back down a road of misery, chaos, and war. What am I? 